Welcome everyone. Happy Tuesday. Uh, thank you for tuning in to our webinar. Today we're going to be talking about the power of private equity funds inside of your IRA. It is top of the hour and I do want to be respectful of your time, so let's just go ahead and get started. I'm Renika Lightborn with Advanta IRA and I'm joined by our distinguished guest, Ms. Jasmine Willowat, the, the president of uh, Nat Private Equity Club. Welcome and thank you, Jasmine. So Jasmine is going to go over the fundamentals of private equity investing, uh, the roles and the types of private equ equity opportunities, and some of the risks and also challenges um, that investors need to be mindful of. But before I turn it over, I do want to give you just a general synopsis of what self-directed IRA is and how it works. And then, of course, when you're ready to get started, uh, the steps to take with us here at Advanta. If you have questions, uh, feel free to put those in the question box. We will um, answer those as, as we go, but also allocate additional time at the end um, if needed. So again, my name is Renika Lightborn. I'm one of our business development specialists here at Advanta. I've been with Advanta um, as an employee since 2019, so uh, about five years now, um, but I'm also an Advanta IRA client prior to joining. Uh, so self-directing self is something that I personally and actively um, you know, advocate. Uh, obviously, private equity is, is an interest to me, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to Jasmine's content today. If you have questions or you want to talk more about your specific scenario, are you always welcome to give me a call or send me an email or definitely visit our website at Advanta IRA. It's a great resource. Uh, you can schedule a consultation there as well. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we get started. At Advanta, we don't give you any tax, legal, or investment advice. All of the information that's going to be presented today is just for educational purposes. So as always, we always encourage you to uh, you know, do your due diligence, consult with your professional team, uh, whether that includes your attorney, your CPA, or financial advisors uh, before making any investment decisions. Uh, just quick takeaway, if self-direction is a new concept for you, uh, just know that any IRA or former employer plan, like an old 401k or TSP type plan, qualifies to be self-directed. Uh, the beauty or the, um, the benefit of self-direction is obviously you get to choose the investment. Today we're focusing specifically on private equity, but you have complete control over um, what is it that your IRA invests in. And then of course, just knowing that all of the income that's generated from that investment flows back into your retirement account. If there's any related expenses, it's paid out of the retirement account. Uh, just a little history about Advanta and who we are. Uh, we've been in business for 21 plus years now as the leading self-directed IRA administrator in the country. Um, while we don't give any tax, legal, or investment advice, our team is comprised of attorneys and also certified services, IRA services professionals. Um, our headquarters is located in the Largo, Florida, which is the general Tampa Bay area. Advanta also has an office in Atlanta, which is where I'm personally um, located. But we do work with clients nationwide uh, as we have uh, well over $2.7 billion under our administration. One of the things that we uh, you know, take great pride in at Advanta is providing our, our clients and our audience uh, just that high level um, you know, concierge style service where you have an assigned account manager as a client, but also too um, providing you great educational content where we have uh, practitioners and experts such as Jasmine coming into knowledge share um, with you in terms of the different opportunities that's available. Uh, this webinar is recorded, so it will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel, uh, typically within 24 to 48 business hours. Uh, you can also uh, find it in our uh, video library on our website. But also, too, I would encourage you, again, check out our website. It's a great uh, resource for you. We have other uh, events that we typically do. And then, of course, my colleague Alex um, hosts our podcast, which is a, a, um, an excellent, more so informal type um, content um, creation for you. So exactly what is a self-directed IRA? Just very simply, just means that you as the account owner, you're gonna have complete control over your retirement funds. You have complete control over the investment decisions in terms of what is it that you're investing in. It gives you the ability to really truly diversify outside of the traditional stocks and bonds. Uh, most of our clients do have holdings in real estate, whether it's a single family or you know, a rental unit. Um, obviously today we're focusing solely on, on private equity, um, but you have the ability to invest in notes and mortgages. I know Jasmine knows that industry very well. She is the expert when it comes to that. Uh, you can certainly use your IRA to invest in tax liens, uh, precious metals, private lending, oil and gas. So it's essentially it's near limitless in terms of what's on the table for you um, when it comes to investment. So why do people choose to self-direct? Uh, you may look to self-direct for many different reasons. I'll just touch on three of those. Um, one of them is, you know, just if you have an existing IRA or you have an old employer plan, um, just sitting idle instead of, you know, tapping into your rainy day fund or taking out a bank loan. 
uh, you can elect to move, you know, a portion or, you know, all of those funds into your next uh, investment inside of your, your IRA. Uh, the other reason as to why someone may choose to self-direct is the, the volatility in the stock market. Uh, there can be something happening overseas um, that impact, impact our stock market here. Whereas with real estate or, you know, some type of asset-based um, investment, we know it's always going to retain some value. Uh, so you get to really diversify and not be, um, you know, subject to the fluctuation in, in the traditional markets. And then, of course, the tax benefits, having those rents, those profits, uh, profits, those dividends flow back into your retirement account, tax free or tax deferred, depending on the type of retirement account that you have. In terms of the types of accounts that can be self-directed, it's the accounts that you're already familiar with. Uh, the term self-directed, again, just simply means that you get to decide what is it that you want to invest in. But the actual account type is the same that you would find at your traditional, you know, Vanguard or Fidelity or so forth. So for individuals, uh, you have traditional IRA, which is pre-tax, um, you know, tax deferred accounts. And um, then you have a Roth IRA, um, meaning you like to pay the taxes up front. As long as you hold that Roth account for five years and you're now, uh, and you 59 and a half, you get to take distributions tax free. If you are an entrepreneur, you have a side business, or you know you have your business owner, you do have the option to self-direct a SEP, simple or solo 401k. I know a solo 401k, if you're eligible for it, it does have um, you know some great flexibility, higher contribution limits. So if that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out to me. We can do a deeper dive on that. Some lesser accounts, but also just as important, are educational savings accounts. So if you have kids or grandkids or nieces and nephew, uh, you can certainly look to, to self-direct those accounts uh, for them. And then, of course, um, you know, having a high deductible medical plan, you're, you would be eligible for an HSA. So I would definitely encourage you to um, you know, check that out, be, um, be vigilant in, in terms of making sure that you, have, you put yourself in the best position to you know, be able to afford medical care you know, here on out. And then, of course, just knowing that any form of employer plan, again, whether it's an old 401k or TSP or 403b or, you know, 457, uh, you can certainly look to self-direct. The only thing that you need to be mindful of, if it's a current employer plan and you're not yet 59 and a half, most times they will restrict you from moving those funds. Uh, you can certainly reach out to them, to your employer, to see if they'll make an exception if it's a current plan and you're not yet 59 and a half. If it's an old job, then you can certainly move it at will. In terms of funding your account, uh, you have a couple ways you can fund. Um, you can certainly do a, a transfer from an existing IRA. Uh, there's no tax liabilities for you to do that. You can move as much or as little as you want to or need to. At Advanta, we'll actually initiate that request on your behalf. Um, you just fill out our appropriate paperwork. If it's an old employer plan, like an old 401k, uh, you would actually have to initiate that. You're not taking a personal distribution. You're just letting that you know, plan provider know you're moving it over to another qualified retirement account. Again, we'll be able to guide you through that, provide you the, the appropriate verbiage on, on how to do that. And then, of course, uh, the other way that you can fund your account is by making an annual cash contribution. As long as you have earned income, you can uh, look to, to make a contribution. Uh, I know uh, tax, tax day was, what, Monday? Um, so just yesterday uh, for contribution for 2023. Uh, for 2024, you still have the ability to contribute up until April of next year. If you have a traditional R Roth IRA, if you're under the age of 50, you can put in 7,000. If you're over the age of 50, you have that additional $1,000 catch up where you can put in um, up to 8,000, again, as long as you've earned income. If you have a SEP IRA for you know, self-employed uh, for 2024, you can put in um, up to 69,000 if you're under the age of 50, uh, not to exceed 25% of your earned income. Uh, with the solo 401k, again, uh, one of the, the benefits is you get to contribute, um, you know, twice in a sense, uh, contribute as an employee and then match as an employer. Um, as an employer, you match up to 25%. Um, so as long as you don't exceed the 69,000 if you're under the age of 50. So again, it gives you the ability to put in, you know, a maximum amount um, or high dollar amount compared to the, uh, the IRA accounts. For ESAs, you can put in 2,000 per year per child. Again, that's to cover education or related expenses. And then with an HSA, as long as you have a high deductible plan for an individual, you can put in 4,150. If you have a family HSA, then you can put um, 8,300. If you're over the age of 55 for an HSA, you have an additional $1,000 that you can catch up. Uh, the process for us is pretty straightforward. When you're ready to get started, uh, it's just three simple steps. Again, myself or one of my colleagues can guide you through that. 
or you can actually go to our website where you know pay, uh, step one is filling out our application uh, the ira account application you can do electronically the 401k that's a little bit more um, cumbersome so we'll have to actually um, get on a consultation call and walk you through that but essentially the ira uh, you can do it in 15 minutes in terms of the paperwork once your account is open again you will have an assigned account manager that's going to be with you for the life of your account with us uh, so that's step one. Uh, typically, we get your account open within 24 to 48 business hours. So it's a pretty quick turnaround. Uh, step two is funding. Uh, you have, again, the option to either, um, you can do you know either or, or a combination of all three, meaning you can make an annual cash contribution as long as you have earned income. You can transfer from an existing IRA, or you can do a rollover from an old employer plan. And then finally, step three is, you know, start investing. What is it that you have an interest in? Is it private, you know, private equity, something that Jasmine's going to um, discuss today? And then, of course, um, Advanta will just kind of guide you through that. We don't give you advice, but we just help you dot the I's, cross the T's, make sure you're making the investment um, correctly in compliance with the IRS rules. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jasmine. Just bear with me one moment. Let me make you the presenter. All right. How's everyone today? Reporting to you from sunny San Diego in my son's room as my computer is in the Apple store for repair. So um, excited to be here. Renika, before you leave, I want to, um, especially since I'm talking about private equity, I want to have you clarify one thing for the listeners. When they are investing with their IRA into um, uh, these funds, if I'm under, if I remember correctly, if I understand correctly, you said we do with our fund, they have to uh, opt for the, the debt shares versus the equity shares when they're, when they're trying to invest in the fund. Is that correct? in order to use the IRA money? It, it depends in terms of, um, you know, I know some some providers do, you know, accredited, non-accredited, so just really depending on the offering itself. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, most times in this case with private equity, um, they're acting as passive investors. Um, okay. So there's different ways you can structure it. Yeah, that's what I, I to understand, especially so our fund is um, fully accredited and people want to be passive. So, all right, well, thanks so much. Uh, can you guys see my screen behind me? I, that I don't know. All I see is myself. So yeah, I'm gonna try to I, I can see a screen, so the audience should be able to. All right, let me go ahead and shrink this. Well, welcome to um, my presentation. I'm really excited about talking to you guys about private equity because it's changed my life. Um, I've got a few things. Let me figure out if I can shrink this and get it out of my here without logging out of here. Uh, screenshot, no. Um, while, while you did that, a question came up and I just want to answer it really quickly. It says, you stated uh, cost fees are drawn from the self-directed account. I found out uh, you can pay fees separately, other words from funds outside of your SDIRA account, credit card, et cetera, thereby not deleting um, deleting or depleting funds from the SDIRA account. Yes, that, that's um, actually correct. You have the option with our clients, if it's related specifically to uh, make, maintaining the account. If it's an actual um, investment, let's just say your IRA bought, you know, one, two, three Main Street, and you have to pay property taxes, then the um, the fee or the cost of that property tax will have to be paid from the actual cash in the IRA account itself. But if you have an advancer related account, and obviously we have, you know, our related administrative costs, um, which is nominal compared to um, you know the investment, you would you have the option to pay for your advancer related fees by a card on file. But if it's a, um, a fee or a cost specific to the investment itself, then it has to be paid by the IRA and not your personal card. Gotcha. That's amazing information. Um, that's why we love working with you. All right, I'm ready for you. Thank you so much for your patience. And today I want to talk to you about how we as private investors can bring our own seat to the table. Um, so that's something I'm very passionate about. I've known uh, Renika here for, God, where are we going on for good five plus years, if not longer. And so one of the things that we have, have had in common for that time is that we love to educate investors like ourselves on how we too can get a seat at this table that all the, you know, the 1% sit around. So thank you for your time today. I'm going to breeze through this. This is a larger presentation about private equity, um, but I'm going to also focus on the note aspect of it. But more importantly, the wide uh, way that we can take advantage of private equity and just educate you on ed uh, private equity a little bit. So. With that said, I want to say thank you so much to Renika for having me. Um, always want to put those manners out there. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to meet. I've been talking about doing a um, a small like class or something out there in Georgia at her facility, so look forward to doing that. But again, thank you for having the opportunity. She will also be speaking to our community. Um, I believe it's either next month or the, the, the month before, sure. but look out. Yeah. 
two months. Thank you. So look out for her on our platform as well so you can get uh, some more education about self-directed IRAs. We love using them. Um, and just so you know, about 90% of the transactions done within my community are done through self-directed IRA funds and companies just like Monika. So real quickly go through a table of contents so you know what to expect just in case you want to dip in and out. I have a degree in economics. So I'm always going to tell you a little bit about the economy and how you um, can really take advantage of the other means that are at your disposal um, and when using the economy. I'm sorry, when you are an active part of the economy. So a um, little bit about myself. Um, my, my message to you is that I want to draw attention to the inequities that are present in inequity, um, in private equity, right? So a lot of us, whether it's because of our background or whether it's because women, minorities, we have been excluded from this for far too long. And so one of the things I want people to understand is how we can get involved and the safest ways for us to get involved in the risk uh, as well as the reward that you get from private equity. Because when it's foreign, you usually stay away from it, right? So one of the things that we want to do is say, hey, there are people like us getting involved with this and really using it to forge our way into doing generational wealth um, and also securing our financial future. And so living in San Diego, if you can imagine, <laughs> I run into a lot of people, if not a good portion of people I run into have, quote unquote, have it made to the extent where they're living in San Diego, right? And so they're usually not working a nine to five. They, they really have their life set up for them. And so going out with them to lunch and things like that and questioning how, how they do it, a lot of it, the past have always led to private equity. So that's why this is one of my passions. Um, let's see, we're going backwards. All right. So a little bit about myself and why I'm here. I know when you can tell you that I have a lot of experience in this, but here's where I come from. I have over 25 years in security and real estate, uh, sorry, 25 plus securities and all real estate licenses that I've held over my 25 plus years in this industry. Um, I've had my series seven, my 144. I've even had my CFA and my CFP, if you can imagine that. So I've been there and done that, bought the t-shirt and the hat. One of the things I can tell you is that as the older I got, the less interested I was in A, doing the corporate America thing, B, um, in going out there every day and not bringing some of my people with me, right? And allowing other people to just run the rat race. So I want to take this knowledge and bring it out to uh, people, anyone who will listen, right? Because once you get involved with private equity, your lifestyle starts to change. So as my life started to, style started to change, I felt, and it was my duty to try to educate and bring people alongside with me. So I work with Morgan Stanley Dean Witter in my past. I'm out there in um, out of New York City, which is where I'm originally from. Um, I've had over $380 million on the management in just subprime mortgages. And so those are, those are non-performing as well as performing notes. When I was with GMAC Homecoming, which by the way, notes are such a powerful thing when I talk about private equity. Um, you have to understand that even General Motors, right? They don't just sell cars. They do also do loan origination. Now you do also hold loans. So they're in this through their residential and funding arm. So when you see GMAC, a, uh, Homecomings, RFC stands for Residential Funding. So they fund, Residential Funding Corporation. So make no mistake that debt is a very important piece and everyone's got the hand in it from a profitable side of it, right? They're not just debtors, most of us are creditors and that's what I wanna to talk to you about here. 26 years, Plus, of just real estate. My family actually just raised me in real estate. Um, they've owned a lot of real estate on the East Coast in New York City, where we're from. And again, out here, um, I have done, I've hosted a financial literacy program for the past 10 years, note assistance program. We've now put most of that online. So you can reach me through my website of jasminewilwan.com and you can actually get the online courses. We're no longer doing hands on. But with that said, we are now um, transitioning into a private equity club. So that's what I want to hear to talk to you about the private equity club is specifically here to introduce my members into the huge opportunities that are available within private equity. So how we're gonna do that is by reaching out to educational platforms like this, but we also host live events where we invite general partners from different funds to come and meet and mingle with our community members. Because as we talk about the risk with private equity, you're gonna find that operator risk is one of the main ones. So as we move forward here, um, also member of the Ford uh, Business Council, and I have a podcast called the Neck and Notes podcast that I encourage you to listen to if you're just interested in learning about notes. When we talk about private equity, one of the main things is passivity, okay? So you may not want to learn how to manage your own note portfolio. However, listening to the podcast at least gets you educated enough so that you're aware of what the general partner is doing with your money and how they're managing it and how they should best be managing it. If nothing less, it's good conversation when you go out to them because you're definitely invited to all the parties when you are in private equity. 
So let's talk about private equity from a historical standpoint. I'm going to take it a moment and slow down because I know I always talk fast, so just in case, but that's the New York in me. <laughs> private equity, as we know, it today originated in the 1940s with ARDC, an American Research and Development Corporation. This is something that was done specifically amongst the richest families of America back then. Okay, so when I tell you that it was kept from us, it may, with or without intent, neither here nor there, but even from its origination, private equity was something that was done amongst the richest family of America, right? And they were the firm um, to first accept money from wealthy families to go out and finish the research that they couldn't afford. So when you think about what you're getting involved with, private equity from the standpoint of the many facets of it, right? There's notes we're gonna get into in, in that standpoint, but you are taking your money, right? And you are investing it in another firm that you see potential in. And then you are, in your case, gonna let a general partner take the lead in either adding value to that, right? And or managing it profitably so that you can profit from it. And so therefore you're giving someone else control of the project, but you're gonna be funding it. So private equity firms invest in business opportunities that are often off the beaten path. So that's what's important, okay? Also known as alternative investments, right? When we talk about things that are alternative, alternative to what we are used to doing. So when we talk about the things that we are normally captivated, Monika mentioned a few words um, during her the introduction here, and one of the words that really stuck out to me, she used the word limitless. Limitless. This is why private equity is such a great match with self-directed IRA firms, because it is about time that we, as private investors, also have access to this limited, sorry, this unlimited, right, uh, and limitless amount of investment opportunities. But to the defense, of like consumer protection agencies and and all that those other um, organizations out there that try to protect us from hurting ourselves, private equity is definitely investments, alternative investments that are off the beaten path. So many of us may not have the expertise to manage them correctly, but it doesn't mean that we should not have the opportunity to, to partake into the profit. So that's really what I want to talk to you about is making sure that you can align yourself with general partners and operators who, who you know, they have proven track records and special skill sets that can manage the underlying asset and in turn, share that profit with you for the, for the financing. So let's talk real quickly about what that profit usually looks like. So when you're investing in funds, you're usually looking at a preferred rate and then they will do an equity share at the back end, right? And so when you are investing in them, understand that there's a couple of things that come with them that we're going to get to, but one of them is time, right? So you're going to have to know that person knows what they're doing, and then you're going to have to give them the time to, to put that to work. So let's talk about the characteristics of private equity. This I find to be very important, and here's why. <clears throat> if you don't grow up as a pilot, for example, if you don't grow up as a zookeeper, as another example, then there are certain things that you are just not familiar with in that trade. There's certain characteristics that you may not be comfortable with. And in certain cases, whether it's a zookeeper, right, or a pilot, these things can cost you, whether it's life or death or money, if you're not familiar with the characteristics, right, or may even just keep you from engaging in it. You may never ever get that pilot's license or even go take that training class at the zoo because you just don't understand the characteristics and what you need to make it through. So that's what I want to talk to you about here for a few minutes, if you allow. We're going to talk about one of the main characteristics that you have to understand with private equity is that it is illiquid, okay? So you're going to want to have that money that you want to put away for three to seven years. Typical, it's about four to five years, but three to seven years is max. I haven't seen many more than seven years. It's because you have to give them time, and by them, the general partners, to put the plan in play. So depending on what it is, again, if you're looking at someone who's going to be rebuilding storage facilities from scratch, <coughs> You're going to have to give them time to build it, put the plan, to, the plan should be together already, but build it, put the plan in action, and then fill the storage facility before you start getting your money back, right? So that's when you're looking at those timelines. So private equity is typically reserved for individuals or institutions who can commit their funds for a period of three to seven years. <coughs> Excuse me. As mentioned, that this extended time frame allows the general partners to execute their business model through acquisition, active management, and then exiting it. Okay, so the same thing will apply when we talk about notes, but keep that in mind is that 
This is illiquid. If you're someone who has thirty, fifty thousand dollars and you're going to need it in year two, then this probably is not the best thing for you because you are going to limit the amount of uh, profit, and sometimes it might even be penalties for withdrawing. Okay, so keep in mind that this is a place with illiquid. And that's why self-directed IRA funds, in my opinion, are a great, great place for private equity because this is your retirement money. You're not supposed to have access to it for a good three to five years anyway, right? Most of you are, have, a, have a good 10 plus years to retirement. And again, I'm not sure who's out there in the audience, but if you have at least five years, then this is something that you want to think about with your self-directed IRA funds. But keep in mind, I said in San Diego, there are a lot of people who use private equity outside of the IRA firms as well. But it's again, the same thing I want you to know is that this is money you're going to put away for a good three to five years. Going to the second thing, active ownership and value creation. So many of these fund managers are renowned experts. So as Monika mentions, I have a past from managing from Wall Street all from my early 20s. So I have a little reputation. These are the people that you want to be running the funds, right? And so it's not so much whether it's a new fund, right? A lot of people bring their expertise and they're opening up their first fund or they open up their second or third fund, right? But it's about track record. So make sure they have established and proven processes because the main goal and how you're going to make money is that they have to not only know what they're doing, but they have to learn how to actively own it correctly and then add value, right? So you see a lot of this private equity surrounding um, small businesses or tech industries. Um, like she mentioned before, you might even find some with um, more passive things with gems and, and, and gold. But the, the, the bottom line between all of them is they're trying to buy something and over time, value will be either added or created, okay? So you're gonna need that time. So active ownership um, and value creation are the keys that you wanna look in for the underlying asset of these portfolios that you're looking to get involved with. So one of the ones I love is assisted living, right? We all know assisted living is huge. It makes a lot of money. Well, um, in a few months, we will have a uh, trusted associate of mine who runs an assisted living fund come and speak to my private equity club. Why? Because that's what's important. So how do we get access to those type of returns without having to actually go <laughs> and manage an assisted living, right? All right, good stuff. Let's talk about limited partnership structure. That's another Jessica, huge character. I had a question really quick before you go to the next, um, yes. if I may. Uh, the question is, uh, what if I do need to exit my investment before the three to, uh, three to seven years? You mentioned possibly a penalty or um, a cost to, to exit. Can you provide insight or it varies based on the fund? Yeah, it hundred percent varies based on the fund. And what I would say is this is one of the reasons why you want to get to know your general partners, right? If you have a relationship with a general partner and it's not one of these big, big funds, then, you know, especially if it's going to cause you a hardship, you can work with them to get yourself without um, occurring a fee. But yeah, sometimes there might be penalties, meaning that you will be capped on how much profit you can take out or you're just going to get your your principal back and not be able to take any profit out because you pro you know the profit was tagged to the exit, right? So if you're not going to last for the exit, then they may say, well, you just get your your, your um, principal back, but you're not going to get any additional, any profit. So the, the penalties will vary based on not only just the fund, but also your relationship, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you so much for answering. All right. So let's talk about the structure. Private equity is commonly structured as limited partnerships. This provides the investors with an advantage of passive involvement, while general partners handle all the day-to-day -day operations, right? So you guys will be uh, invited to annual meetings and we put on nice parties for you guys annually. But that's the main purpose of this is that, especially when people use it for retirement, right? The goal is to find something that they can be passive. And so if you see Bitcoin or if you see, you know, hospitals, a lot of people are converting um, movie theaters into warehouses or hospitals. And you're like, that's a genius idea. I get it. It makes sense to me. Well, you may not be have the capacity, the time, or the desire, or the wherewithal to go and get that done, but you go and find someone who does. And that's what we want to be able to introduce you uh, to here with the Private Equity Club. And that way you can invest and still take advantage of that. All right. Lastly, I want to tell you is that this is a very competitive returns, right? And so there are two ways to get involved with this. You can handle it yourself, right? And so we'll talk about mortgage notes here when we get to that section where you can buy notes yourself, right? And you can manage your portfolio yourself. And there you're going to get direct um, access to the profit, right? But you're also managing it. On the other note, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of times you can go and invest in a fund, still have access to the profit, but not 
and those competitive returns, but again, not have that active role in it. So what type of returns are we looking at? It's going to depend on what type of private equity is supporting that fund. When you're looking at debt funds like mortgages, et cetera, you're looking at anywhere from about 8% to about a 10% return. And that's going to be on the debt side, which is passive. And then you, they, we usually will offer an equity split of about 20% of the profit split on the back end, right? So that's what you're going to get used to. If you're investing in a fund, as Monika mentioned, there's tons of different alternative investments out there. I also have a good friend, Kelly Wingett, who um, owns a um, oil and mineral rights fund, right? And so if you're going to get invested in that, which, again, I would definitely hand her my money and instead of me trying to get involved with oil and mineral rights myself. She's offering uh, returns that are going to hit double digits all the time, right? It's anywhere from 11 to like 13 14%. Sometimes it'll get a little higher because you'll have a split on the back end too. So you have to understand that it's all about the asset behind it. You can also get into M&A. If you have an M&A fund, right, then you're going to see, that's when you start getting into three, four, five, and people start talking about triple, um, you know, 6x your money. Because these are people who are taking down software companies, adding value to it, right? And then over time, and then maybe selling it or holding it for private equity, but selling, usually selling it. So you're going to tri triple, sometimes 6x your money. So understanding the underlying asset is the first thing I would like you to say is say, what am I interested in, right? So um, Monika mentioned that too. What are you interested in? So figure out what you're interested in, what makes sense to you, and then go find a general partner who runs a fund that is specifically geared to extracting opportunities based on that particular industry. Hopefully that makes sense. It does, Jasmine. Really quick, the next question before you go to the um, move on. It says, how often will you or do you communicate with your um, private equity uh, fund investors? Every two weeks. So if you're part of the community, then we have a bi-weekly call set up where we just meet for an hour just to figure out if we need to move the ball forward and what we're doing. It's all about being active. Um, so it depends on how we are at your stage. Some people will take, put us on pause. But when you're active, we're meeting on a bi-weekly basis. And then every month we have two meetings that you can come out to either virtually and or um, in person to do the networking. So it's both online and um, in person. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Of course, role of private equity in the economy. So let's talk about that real quickly because I can't help it. As mentioned, I'm an economist, but let's talk about why it was so important that private equity is here. Because now that we know that we can get involved with it, but it's like, well, what is the function of it? And again, when you invest in private equity, you can also rest and feel comfortable that you are involved with not just value creation, you're helping companies out and grow, but job creation in the local economy, liquidity, right? Innovation. So liquidity with the companies, right? You help the companies be liquid so they can do their R&D and, and get more of that in, innovation. And then cr creative restructuring, like those mezzanine fundings and things like that. And so when you think about what moves this world forward, right? And for those of you who invest in the stock market like, like I am or who are privy of it, a lot of times what we're doing is we're giving these companies funds so they can do what? Invent the next VR headset so they can go ahead and invent that that robot that vacuums our house ladies right, without us touching it and so this is the value of private equity versus us just investing in the normal things that we're not we're regularly used to so feel free to understand that this is going to peak into your entrepreneurial side so a lot of you guys if you're familiar with and just small tangent there's a qqq that's commercial that's actually a fund that's traded on wall street that allows you a regular investor to invest in high tech stuff without you having to know about high tech stuff. So, so it's amazing, it's an amazing opportunity for us. So you can invest in private equity outside of Wall Street and that's really what people like Monika and, and, um, and Vanta and myself are here to educate you on because otherwise you will get drowned out by the millions and billions of dollars, it's probably billions at this point that Wall Street uses to market to us. And you have to understand, why do they do that? Because they want you to funnel your money to them versus some of these smaller things. So we talked about the types of private equity uh, briefly. So here's a good visual on it, right? We've got mezzanine financing. Okay, so this is financing that combines debt and equity characteristics and provides these companies more creative strategies when it comes to their ability to raise funds. So if banks are not able to take on the risk, then they can come to us, right? For expansion and acquisition. A lot of us are familiar that there's the whole um, legalizing of marijuana that's going on out there, who's funding that until the banks are able to get into it? Private equity, right? And so the good news about that is when you think about industries like that, 
allowing private equity to come in, it makes it a lot more safer because regardless, that funding was going on, right? Just going on in the black market. So once we get things out into the private equity space, there's a more, dare I say legal, but even exercise processes that you can go through to get involved with these alternative investments without having to be exposed. Another example is I love one of my my uh, investments I'm getting into now is going to be mangoes, right? I love mangoes, mango farms, mark my word, America's about to fall in love with mangoes, we're going to have a mango obsession. But the good news is that I don't have to go out and, and, and grow my own mango farm <laughs> or invest in my own mango farm. I can go into private equity and finance people like that. So um, again, this is a great place to learn where I will be exposing you to opportunities like that. So mezzanine financing is one. Debt is where I, is where I operate. So this is where you're going to find the expertise that I bring to the group is going to be surrounding debt. So I can help you with uh, purchasing loans, acquiring loans, uh, getting loans, right, to grow. So anything to do with debt, and that's what our fund does. We buy performing notes around residential uh, mortgages, and we hold on to them, especially right now in this environment when the rates are so high. So the good news is that we're out there trying to cap. The best way to think about it is trying to accumulate all the mortgages that are being created right now at these higher rates and hold on to them before the interest rate starts going down again right and the next thing you know we are the ones collecting all the 12 percent and you can't find the 12 percent to save your life so if you're old enough to remember 1980 you know whether or not you are even in the market getting for a home loan or not if you remember it they were doing loans at about 18 percent imagine if you were able to grab a whole bunch of paper that was paying you that amount of money right now. Now, the good news is that hopefully a lot of people we finance on their way out, but until then, we want to be the one that captured that debt. And so that's what we do here. That's what we specialize in. The rest of these are the ones or, or opportunities that we will bring the experts in to speak to you about. So when we talk about venture and growth capital, this is what I talk to you about when we talk about going out and acquiring um, firms that you, uh, sorry, this is where I talk to you about going out and funding startups, right? So you're going to be uh, seeding companies, and then you have leveraged buyouts, and these are going to be mostly where you're taking already established companies and either buying them out, right, and or using them as a takeover so that you can get inside it from the executive, and you won't do that. Obviously, the, the fund manager does, but they go inside to take over the company so they can redirect the funds and make sure that it's being run correctly. So a lot of times, the person who originates the business is not the best person to take it to the next level. So private equity, in my opinion, that's what we do. If you're an entrepreneur on this call, you know how, how it is. You have your baby, you start your firm, right? But at some point, you have to allow your baby to leave the house, and that's where private equity usually comes in, and they will purchase it from you and take it on. The, another example of that is Campbell's Soup. If you think about that, I am good friends with the guy who runs the estate for Campbell's Soup. He lives in Hawaii. Campbell Soup Company, this Campbell family haven't owned a soup company in so long, right? Because private equity came, brought them out, kept the name, changed the labels, modernized it, and did all the things you're seeing now. The Campbell family would have never, and I hate to say that, but it would have been a long time in coming before they would have said, hey, let's try all these different flavors. Let's do all that stuff. So that's where private equity comes in. They come with the money and boom, it gets done. So when we talk about private equity and how it helps you with the, your financial security, there are three main things I want you to understand. Passive income, which is the one we all hear about, right? And so you're able to get involved with these assets that have tractions within areas that, again, you would normally not have an opportunity to take uh, advantage of. So when we think about everything from Beats headsets, right, all the way down to <clears throat> some of these AU, ADUs that are being used. If you don't have the land, how do you take advantage of it? You get into passive income and into private equity. That's how you become a part of this party. Principal preservation. A lot of us are here for that. And that's one of the reasons private funds are adored so much. If you put in $100,000, at the end of that five or seven years exit strategy, you're going to get your $100,000 back. All along, you've been getting your payments of an 8% or whatever your um, your rate is, your guaranteed rate to you, that is going to be paid to you either on a quarterly basis, a monthly basis, or an annual basis. So you want to check in and find out how often those payments are made. But at the end of the day, your principal is always preserved and you're going to get that back. 
And a lot of the times, if you're out there, one of the best things to do is find these people because there are people who just roll their money from one fund to the next. That's their new job. They've retired. They sold their business from uh, tech or what have you. And now they've got a lump sum of money. And so what do they do with it? They divide it in different private equity funds. This one's three years. This is five years. This is seven years. When this one matures, now I got to go hunt and look for a new place to roll my money over. And now it's settled for the next five years. So if you can just picture that, you believe in manifestation, this is the lifestyle that you start getting into when you get into private equity. So if you're looking to retire within the next five years or so, this is the club for you, right? We want to get you in front of the people and get you around the people who are on that path, getting retired for the next five years, because I'm leading to the next thing is that your professional and personal network expands beyond your belief. So a lot of these people, when you find these known investors and private equity people, they're not out there at these clubs, you know, and maybe they show up every now and then, and, oh, I use the key to myself. Of course you do. <laughs> right. And so you have to find these little clicks or dare I say little um, enclaves where the really wealthy and successful people hang out. A lot of people will start at these networking clubs, but in the end, once they've made it and they're doing things successfully, they're not out there that much. So you're going to meet them at these private equity parties. And of course, you all know the rule about the people you surround yourself by. So again, I have been. I've benefited, shall I say, tremendously just through my network. I could have started, and <laughs> probably did start at this side of the screen and moved all the way up, right? Started preserving my 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 capital and then getting it to 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 prevent passive for me. But understanding that these are the benefits of private equity, because there are every fund out there. They have an annual party, believe it or not, right? <laughs> Whether invited or not, and um, so all these little that's your new goal should be to seek and is how do I get into that private equity circle? And start expanding my myself to introducing to those family offices and people that are doing the business without having to be out there and get all the fanfare because the business, you know, if you're really doing business, you don't have time for the fanfare. Let's talk about risk and challenges. Unless we have any oh, other quick questions. Question. Yeah, quick question before you go to the risk and challenges. It says, um, I know you referenced that you, um, you know, you're the mortgage notes expert, but the question is, how many funds or products uh, does your firm operate in? Only one. One product. So we specialize and only deal with uh, mortgage debt. So okay. residential back to debt. Um, anything else, I will introduce you to friends of mine in the industry. So that's kind of where that comes from. So I have friends who run a four, for example, last few that spoke ran a foreign exchange fund. So they bought and sold foreign exchange. But I will introduce you to them. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, two other questions that came in. It says, uh, what's the typical size of the funds? And then also, is there like a target return or a specific strategy? Yeah, so my particular fund is mortgage backed notes only, and it's mostly um, performing notes, some non performing notes. Each fund will have a different strategy. So that's how you, I would say you would diversify. Maybe you'd go invest, let's say you're, you're retiring next year and you're going to get a half a million dollars, right? Part of a, a package, what have you. You might want to take 100,000, put it into mortgages, and there's going to be a specific return in there. In that mortgage space, you're going to see anywhere from about 8 to 10% return. You can't really squeeze much more out of that. If you're going to look to get more aggressive, then you can go out and meet with um, Eckerd, for example. These guys do the oil and um, gas, right? And then you get more aggressive. And so your strategy is going to be dependent upon what I would say, like Unique has touched on, what are you interested in? But it's, it's important that you have interest in what your money is backing, specifically just so you can follow and you want to meet these people, right? Um, for us, that half a million dollars might be all, so we don't want to lose it. So if the operational has, and that's where it's going to get to as far as our risk and challenges. That's what's important. But um, just to stay on track as far as your question, because it's threefold. The strategy is going to depend, depending on your strategy, there will be a fund for it, right? So whether you want to go after M&A, um, just more, less risk, right, with like mortgages, but each category is going to come with its own risk. Um, and then what was this third part of that question? I'm sorry, the, the, yeah, what says your target return? Like, what's the typical size of your fund and then the target return? Okay, and typical sizes, you're going to find funds anywhere from lowest around 5 million all the way up to 50 to 100. It just depends on the size of the lift. So, some funds raise specifically for projects, and some are um, really goal oriented. And like ours, we're just going to grab out, we're going to grab $50 million worth of notes, and then we're going to go and spread that money amongst each other. Some people are out there raising money to build. Uh, apartment buildings uh, or, you know, 
um, you know, doctor's offices and things like that. So depending on that, that's going to do the return and how much they're looking to raise. A lot of times the raise is going to be specific for the project. So if they're looking to raise for a for a 40 unit apartment building, then whatever that cost is, that's going to be the raise, $20 million, and then they'll stop there. Okay. okay. Uh, another question that just came in. Um, it says, what is the minimum investment for your fund? Also, what are the minimums for other funds? I know each fund is going to be different, but do you have examples of minimums for different ones? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so ours is a 506C, so it's a Reg D, so only for accredited investors. It's going to have a $100,000 minimum, um, and the two tiers are 100000 and 200000 again involved. Um, but you can also, a majority of the funds are not uh, accredited investors only, and you can invest with as little as $50,000, right? And so it's just a matter of what company you want to keep and at the end of the day, what the opportunity is, right? Um, and so just know that $50,000 is a great opportunity for you to get in and there'll be a larger crowd of people, right? And then when you have uh, funds that have higher minimums, then it's obviously a small amount of people that you're, you're, you're mingling with. But either way, the returns are great. So it's just a matter of how you want to spread your, your money and what the requirements are. Okay, a couple of the questions just came in or comment. Um, question is, what is uh, M&A? That's more just an acquisition. Um, and then the right other than, question. Yes. Mm -hmm. The other question is, is there a minimum investment amount and do you have to do it with a self-directed IRA? You don't have to do it in a self-directed IRA. Obviously, it, it behooves you to, um, you know, actively build wealth or diversify in your retirement account, but you take non-IRA non investors as well, correct? A hundred percent. There's two ways to do it. And like she said, the best way is to diversify. So um, especially for the tax advantage, if you still have them, if you're above retirement age, then you'll speak to her more about uh, the best ways to use it. But yes, you definitely, majority of the people are not using their self-directed IRA out in the wide world. In my community, a lot of the majority of the people use their self-directed IRA, but it's typical not to. Okay. I, I have more questions coming in. So that's why I'm asking. Well, um, it says, uh, what is the minimum hold period for your fund? Also, what are some example uh, minimum hold periods for other funds? I know you mentioned the three to seven year time frame. Is that the same thing for yours as well? We have a five year minimum. Um, and as you just have to think about the product, right? We want to buy these mortgages and since we're not flipping them, we just want to hold them. And if you know about the rule of 72 and all that good stuff, about that fifth year, we're definitely going to, that's where we're going to double the money just based on the returns that we have. Also, the notes we, we have. Uh, we buy them at such a discount that we're hitting returns around 15 plus a percent return. And so we hold them for a minimum of five years so that we have an opportunity to double our money and get it back to you. Uh, but yeah, that's going to vary, like I said, based upon the project. Most funds are going to be that five year, that's the average. The three year ones are going to be for things that are shorter, pro shorter lived projects, right? Like if you get into a fund that's looking to build a storage unit or something like that, right? may not take that long, they build it, and then, you know, especially if it's in the right place, they rent it out, and next thing they get, they sell it to someone else, to that M&A, Mergers and Acquisition Fund, right? So a lot of these funds, what's amazing once you start getting into this world, they all kind of, this, they're very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's coming to my mind, but they, they live off each other, they're very symbiotic, I want to say, but, so there are certain funds that are just created to invest in other funds, <laughs> believe it or not, right? And so they will feed off each other because they understand the value of the of, of spreading the risk as well. So just know that just because you know they may just be, you can invest in a fund that just goes around and invest in other funds, right? So it's just about the level of expertise that they have. Do you have any other okay. questions? Yeah, one other question. Obviously, you want to consult with your um, you know, your advisor or your you know tax professional. But the question is, how do you become an accredited investor? I know you have to you know obviously check with the SEC uh, guidelines. I think it's like you have to make at least 200,000 uh, for two years in a row, have a certain amount of assets, not including your primary residence, but if you can um, kind of. Yeah, um, I don't have all that. There are some specific rules to doing that. I don't have all the details in front of me that I can rattle off the top of my head, but here's a few things I'll tell you about accredited investors. Um, one, if you're not accredited yet, it's pretty, it's not as hard as it seems to become accredited. Um, if you use the right tools, uh, people, especially within this community, if you're using notes, you, you know, two or three years investing in notes, you can hit that accredited amount just based on your net worth. Um, and so the net worth is going to be important to there. And so you have to focus on what you're acquiring, what your net worth is, and then your level of sophistication. So if you don't hit it there with the money, you can also prove and let them know that you have that level of sophistication, right? I have been an investor for this long and that long. So the whole thing about accredited investors is that you have to be willing to sign and then prove, right? Uh, so there are caveats for you if you don't have the finances you can say okay i've been a um, financial advisor for x amount of years as a professional i feel comfortable moving into this 
So don't be too intimidated by the credit investor thing. However, um, there are documentation that you can fill and there's a that you fill out for certain funds and certain things you can just hand to your accountant and say, hey, fill this out and they'll let them know. Um, but yeah, there are specific rules. It has to do with how much money you're bringing in. It can be combined and how much um, experience you have and or uh, how much you own and your net worth is. Okay, thank you. I have another question that came in, but I don't know if you want to get to another slide and then we can circle back to that question or I can ask it now. No, go ahead and then I'll move. We'll stop there and keep going. Okay, question is, do you know how much it would cost to start my own fund to get investors? I'm thinking it's mostly legal fees. A hundred percent. And that's one of the things that we help you here with the club, the private equity club, is we are helping you do your fundraising and help you start what's called a special purpose vehicle. So write that down, SPV, look into that. So you don't always want to start with a fund, right? Funds is a heavy lift, like 10 million plus. So I would say if you're looking to do a raise around 10 plus million or 5 million minimum, then consider a fund. But before you get to a fund, special purpose vehicles are a great way to go. Look those up. Um, I can come back and speak about those with you at any point. Um, PPMs, private placement memorandums, and then funds, okay? So I would look at it in that right route. So if you're doing half a million to about 5 million, consider that a special purpose vehicle, consider that a private placement memorandum. Um, but to answer your question directly, and then to move on to the next slide, yes, it cost me about 30, I'd say between 30 and 40,000, just in legal fees and paperwork, just to get the, your fund off the ground. Thank you. All right, of course. All right, so real quickly, I'll breeze past this, like I said, um, but there are risks and challenges when you're investing in these funds. So we want to help you uh, expose you to them and how to navigate them. That's really the purpose of the club. You get to hang around. Look, you got to learn how to walk and talk. One of the people I didn't know how to work with was attorneys before I got into this debt business. And then I hung out with them enough that now I have nothing but attorney friends, right? So you have to learn how to deal with that and know what to look for. But valuation is one of the risks. Um, so again, it's very hard to evaluate the underlying asset. Not many people know Hey, Jasmine, what is this note worth, right? Hey, how much is this dilapidated building worth with the future value? So valuation is one of the first and most important things that you need to know about um, the product that's going to be backing your know, fund that you're involved in. Uh, again, talking about it being a liquid, I don't need to harp on that any much longer. But and then the, another main thing is going to be the operational hazard. So operational hazard is just surrounding whether or not the guy running the fund knows what they're doing. So just without staying on that too long. Do your research and make sure they have a proven track record. Talk to people. Don't take that shortcut. Look them up online. Um, all right. So let's talk about mortgage debt just for a few minutes, and then looks like we're, we'll wrap this up since I know we're, we have an hour. So um, my fund and what we do at the Private Equity Club, we specialize in finding debt. So let's talk about one of the, the things we're doing now. We're taking down uh, $6 million worth of mortgage notes in Oklahoma my community is and what's amazing about these notes is that they have a 12 and three quarter rate so this is the type of stuff that i work hard to go out to find and then bring this debt back to my community and we buy it okay that until the injury we're getting it at a discount so imagine if i went and found a family office but this is what happened i found a family office and they have 116 notes okay so these are um, mortgages that they put out there and other people are paying on and they have great pay history this is oklahoma right um, great equity in them. They were all originated about five years ago or so. And for some reason they have to sell. And so we're coming in and I'm saying, I will take down the entire pool of notes, all 6 million of them. And we also get them at a discount. So at a 10% discount and, a, and the yield is a 12 and three quarter, you can imagine we're hitting some very, very aggressive <laughs> and nice passive income RRIs, right? But you're not going to find that out on the street. If Wall Street had that, they would cut it. If a fund gave it to you, Again, you get to 8%, even though we're making that 15, 20%. So a lot of times, depending on how aggressive you are and what level of operations you're gonna need, passive income and mortgage notes are really great because you can buy them directly. You don't have to have an operation. You can get that direct 12, 15% and not have to worry about the operation cost that the fund is taking out of it, right? Either way, it's very aggressive, right? Whether you're getting 8% because you're letting someone else manage it, right? So that difference is in their expenses. Or if you're going to go and buy the debt yourself, this is what we do. So mortgage debt can provide substantial and consistent passive income through the collection of principal and interest payments for the term of their loan. Most of these loans that we're purchasing are 30 to 15 years and have close to 20 to 10 more years left on them. And that's why we're getting a discount. So we're putting those things into either the fund, and our fund is called the Make Money and Go to Heaven Fund, 
or we're putting them into small portfolios that we're building for our um, our members. This is my executive team here. Uh, we've been at it together for over a decade, and I you know, just want to thank you for your time here today, and hopefully this was helpful. Based on the questions, I will take more, but um, based on the questions, they were very, very um, good questions, and I think this was helpful. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jasmine. You're always just a, a wealth of, of knowledge. Um, uh, thank you all for asking questions. If you have additional questions, just feel free to go ahead and put those in the question box. Uh, Jasmine, again, you know, just again, I appreciate you just coming into our audience and just knowledge sharing. If you have any parting words, you know, feel free to, you know, just uh, let our, our, our group know. Um, but yes, I, I would just say don't be intimidated out there. This private equity stuff is has been it's, it's called private equity for a few reasons. One of them is just really private. But um, you are welcome to these circles. And uh, the more we get out there, the more they're going to start looking like us and got a lot more women involved those of you out there. So send, send your, your, your daughters out there. Let's get involved because this private equity is huge. A lot of the funds that we introduce you to are women run. So just know that, you know, um, what they say, representation is important. I want to see more of you guys out there doing it. Uh, thank you, Jasmine. Um, again, if you want to know more about self-direction, just feel free to, you know, reach out to me directly, visit our website. Um, if you want to know more about Jasmine and her team over at Nat Private Equity Club, uh, you're welcome to uh, visit our website or just you know feel free to send them an email again audience thank you so much for taking the time to uh, listen to our, our webinar today this will be um, uploaded on our youtube channel later today or first thing tomorrow with that um, happy investing everyone <laughs>